Christ, okay? Father, thank you for this privilege of being together and hearing your word, of fellowshipping, encouraging one another, hearing um, from your inspiration of both Old Testament and pointing to new and ways that deepen our understanding of you and your relationship with us, your relationship with your people. We ask that you would guide and direct uh, as we go to the scriptures now. We thank you for this opportunity in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, good afternoon. Welcome to worship here at Grace Communion Melbourne as we're going through a Bible study topic this afternoon in this small group. And this summer we've been going through The God Who Speaks, a DVD series that we've been studying. Um, and we learned from it how we can trust the authority of God's word, the, or, the, ri the origin of God's word, how we can trust it to be God's word was uh, the central to that whole study. Our goal was to strengthen our ability to read the Bible in such a way that both our minds and our hearts become fully engaged and we become better equipped uh, to live the life and to witness and to love as God wants us to love. This afternoon I'll be sharing a bit from author Adam Hamilton's insightful gems from his book, Making Sense of the Bible, Rediscovering the Power of Scripture Today. Uh, he is uh, quite a well-known author, and that's quite a subject to take on, isn't it? So let's go to God's Word. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. We're also going to read now from Psalm 119, a psalm that David was inspired to write, verses 97 through 106. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it's always with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn away from your ordinances, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. This is God's word for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I'd like to begin by asking a question for those seated here and for those who are watching. Who is your favorite Old Testament character? Give you a moment to think about that. Your, your personal favorite could be Abraham, David, Moses, Esther. Um, and as you think about that character and his or her life and why they remain your favorite Old Testament character, let me ask, do we have any Samson fans? <laughs> Not too many hands usually, it's not our first thought, but uh, he's kind of the Hulk of the Old Testament, you know. Um, when I imagine what Samson might have looked like, this mental picture of Fabio Lanzoni pops into my head. You know, obvious shoulder length hair, flexing chiseled muscles, posing for the cover of whatever romance novels were popular in 1000 BC, quite vain. A bevy of admirers clamoring for his autograph on their papyrus scrolls perhaps even launching his own uh, cologne fragrance in the Bronze Age. Um, some of the Old Testament characters seem more fanciful than real at times, don't they? So back to reality, I'll share one of my favorites in just a bit. But if you chose Abraham as your favorite character, you're in good company. From our scripture reading in Genesis, we see far-reaching implications for all the nations of the earth as God touched the lives of Abraham and Sarah in very unique and in miraculous ways. In fact, for all who lack a Jewish or Hebrew ancestry, 
Abraham's trust in God's promise foretells our own calling card of inclusion in God's plan of salvation. Now, throughout Christian history, we have tried to figure out the place of the Old Testament in worship. In fact, some of the earliest church controversies were related to this very question. The Old Testament begins with a collection of foundational stories found in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. And some read these early stories as literal events and people set on a very precise timeline. And many of them do indeed have a, a connection to real life and real people. But if you ask the Jewish people from whom these scriptures come, they understand them a little differently. They see them not so much about the particularity of the people and the factual nature of the events they relate, but as theological reflections on the nature and character of God, especially in the first book of the Bible. But God's relationship to the world is revealed to us. God created the world and all that's in it with passion and with a good purpose. When we arrive at Genesis chapter 12, the narrative shifts from the story of God and humans in general to the story of God's relationship with a particular people, a family of people, then tribes and nations of people, the Hebrews. And the story begins here with God's call on Abram. The call to leave his homeland, to leave his father's house, to leave the source of his social network and economic security, and to go to a new land, a land that God would show him, where God would make of him a great nation. So before there was a Mosaic Covenant at Mount Sinai, before the law code was written in stone, before a Levitical priesthood and a sacrificial system, before the tabernacle in the wilderness, God foreshadowed blessing all of the nations on the earth through the faith of one man who believed God. It is here in this text from Genesis 12 that we discover the concept of a salvation by grace not based on our works. As the reformers would name thousands of years later, as one of the five solas, it is by faith alone. Remember, as this promise is made to Abram and Sarah, they have been card-carrying senior citizens for several years. They can't conceive a child on their own, and Isaac would not come into the world by natural ability, but as a gift from God, an act of grace by the God of all grace, who loves his creation and intends that we be numbered beyond the stars of heaven. As the Apostle Paul was inspired to write 2,000 years after Abraham lived in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would reckon as righteous the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. And in verse 14, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Even Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, that critical skeptic of the 19th century, seems to have gotten the message. He, he wrote, heaven goes by favor. If it went by merit, you would stay out and your dog would go in. One of my favorites. Of course, Clemens was also quoted as saying, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. That's certainly something for us to ponder as we think about the context of the Old Testament this afternoon. Because being human involves the process of learning and growing from infancy through childhood to adolescence into adulthood. And the Bible reveals a parallel spiritual growth pattern, an analogy that's presented in several places from maturity, immaturity to maturity. Not just for the individual, but also for people groups as God covenanted with them. God knows our frame. He meets us where we are in every period of human history. He relates intimately to people, claiming them, loving them, and helping them transform. And for us, this richness is reflected even more clearly through Jesus, who we are called to put on, who we are called to grow up into him, which is the head. This is Christ, as Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. And Jesus that we know is a product of the culture of the Old Testament and in every way the fulfillment of the dreams of the Old Testament as well. One curious thing about recalling Bible stories from our youth is that we often are taught an abridged version. Sunday school classes tone down sometime or remove the scariest, most violent details when you're talking to young children. I remember several years ago I was asked to fill in for a Sunday school teacher at the last minute because she fell ill just before her class was about to start. 
This was a class of seven to nine year olds and they were going through the book of Genesis. They come through the flood with Noah and the ark and the beautiful rainbow as a sign in the heavens of God's continuing mercy that he'd never destroy life on earth like that again. But now they had come to Genesis 19. And this is where Abraham's nephew Lot has daughters who launch into a plot of drunkenness and incest in order to preserve the family line. Yeah, jump into that lesson with a group of wide-eyed seven-year-olds. I'm not even going to go there this afternoon with you. So as adults, when we read the R-rated version, which is part of the beauty, if you will, of God's inspired word, that all the pimples and the mistakes and, 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 and the sin of his people, even those that he's working with, are here given to us as part of the real story of redemption. But it's a challenge sometimes, recognizing or in reconciling that violence for our children and grandchildren when they ask questions like, why did all those people have to die like that? Or why did God say that? It can be tough going. People groups are wiped out in conquest of new lands. Human sacrifice is a quite common practice. And part of coming to grips with the violence is realizing that in patriarchal times, the world was a violent place. It was how folks did business. It was how they fought war. In re researching, we can know that of Abraham's day, that child sacrifice was not a strange thing. It was practice in the hometown that he grew up in, in Ur of the Chaldees. Our spiritual ancestors were influenced by these cultural norms, even as God challenged them to come out from them, just as we are today. The real discovery for Abraham was learning about the kind of God who stopped him short of taking Isaac's life. Abraham <laughs> believed God would provide, but he didn't know how. And as an aside, if Isaac was old enough to carry that supply of wood on his back, he also would have been old enough to put up quite a struggle. But he didn't. He doesn't. Paul later quotes from Genesis this account in his letter to the church at Rome. And he says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Some things that don't make a lot of sense to us today were highly relatable to their culture and to their times. They lived in the context, and we struggle to recapture it. One author said, a text without a context is a pretext. There's a case in point in Exodus chapter 23. Israel is given instructions on how not to cook goat meat here we read, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Cooking instructions in the Old Testament. We scratch our heads and we go, what, what's that all about? Well, the pagans offered sacrifices to their many gods in this way, and in some cases they did it as an occult practice, trying to bribe their god into making the land more productive or their livestock more fertile. And Yahweh didn't want his people to have any part of that. To this day, conservative Jews who keep kosher don't eat cheeseburgers because it combines a cooked dairy product with the meat. The Jewish Mishnah became an oral tradition employed by the rabbis to supplement the Torah, the Jewish version of our Old Testament. And in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, one Mishnah describes how the Israelites plucked apples and pomegranates from the walls of the Red Sea as they passed through the waters heading out of Egypt. Now you don't find that detail in Exodus chapter 14. But in verse 29 of that chapter, we do read this. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the, the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Well, as you know the rest of the story, they hung in there for about five chapters until building a golden calf seemed like a great idea while Moses was up on the mountaintop talking with you-know-who about who knows what. Now that rendering you're probably not familiar with. The SAUV stands for Sean's unauthorized version. <laughs> but they doubted. They wanted Moses. They didn't see him, and they fell back into their pagan habits. For them, the description of apples in hand filled with enhanced details of how God would provide for them as they left this life of slavery in Egypt. They, so they, they added a little bit to the text as far as how he provided for them. 
These t scriptures do tell us, though, about the hu human condition. No matter how good we have it or how bad we have it, we go our own way, we rebel, we wander, we choose violence, we're prideful. Israel was called the church in the wilderness. Again and again, we disobey God and his good intention for us. As Adam Hamilton puts in his book, in the midst of reading Israel's history, we find our own history, our own story. And through their stories and their experiences and reflections about God, we hear God speaking to us. Someone referred me to another book this past week that was talking about how to understand the Word of God. And he said, he said, I think one important concept is to realize that God's Word was written for us, not always to us. In other words, we have to know the original context. Who was it written to originally so we can know what is there for us today? And then, as we see in the New Testament, always through the lens of who Christ is. But I really like Hamilton, uh, his title of chapter 3 is the Old Testament in 15 minutes because in some ways uh, it captures what we're trying to do here this afternoon. An actual survey of the Old Testament would be an entire semester or two class in seminary compared to what we undertake in worship week to week. Expository preaching intended to help connect the dots in 30 minutes or less so that we leave inspired and equipped to live out our calling in the world that we are sent to love and witness to by the grace of God. Are these stories true? Yes, but something can be true in a broad sense without being literally factual or scientific for that matter. We read of the sun and its circuit to the course but in, in one of the uh, Psalms, and of course we realize that the sun in that sense doesn't move, the earth is rotating. So it's not a scientific description of what happens at a sunrise or sunset. It's a perception from Earth of how we see the sun rising and setting. The stories seem to bring us a primeval in the Old Testament, even archetypal meaning, dating back to before recorded history. And they point to the big picture about who God is, what, who we are as humans, our relationship to God and to one another. David loved God's instruction as we just read in Psalm, the Psalm 119. He had tasted the fruit of it in his life. Once again, God's word was real and active in the course of his daily life. It was his meditation all day long, as we read. It made him wiser than his enemies. He said, I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. How sweet are your words to my taste. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word is good. The Old Testament of God's word is good for us and does teach us. Its primary purpose is to point us to Christ. But he authored these words for us. David could write from experience, taste and see that the Lord is good. So I said I would share a favorite Old Testament character, mine with you. I think it's still Jonah. Um, have a book from the 1860s entitled Old Test Testament Characters written by a Cunningham Geike, uh, one of the oldest books that I have on my pastoral shelf. And this epic, drop, this epic backdrop of land to sea voyage, destructive storm, nature being stirred by a divine hand in chapter one, there's this dialogue between the ship's crew and Jonah when he has gone below deck hiding and then they learn through drawing straws that he's the flight risk, he's running from God, and this whole season, the whole reason their ship is about to go down in the storm is his fault. Now see, even some of the, the characterizations and the symbols that we read in the Old Testament are here with us today. We can talk about drawing the short straw, and we all know what that means. You're the one that's responsible. You're the one that's singled out, and that's the way that it happened. When they realized it was Jonah, they, they didn't want to throw him overboard. In fact, they begged, please don't let his death be chargeable to us. They started praying to God, these unbelievers, so that he would not hold them responsible as they tossed Jonah overboard. And Jonah, at his own urging, said, throw me overboard. I'm the problem here. And instantly, the seas calmed. The captain and his crew are spared. They're saved in that sense. I don't know if you've ever thought about that scenario in the light of who Christ is. When Jonah is fleeing from God's will, it's dangerous to be in the boat with him. 
But when Jesus, who is always at the center of God's will, lies sleeping below deck during a storm, his disciples are safe. Imagine this watery grave for Jonah. His, his own uh, struggle to, re- to, to deal with the Fred, can I borrow? Page six. Thank you. Jonah's own struggle to deal with the acid of the fish's stomach, <laughs> the, the, the three days or parts of three days in the fish, fish's belly, wrinkled prune. Uh, I don't, we don't know whether it was a giant Jewfish like is on the screen now, or a grouper, or a creature of God's own design for the moment. It just says God created a great fish and it swallowed Jonah. Uh, along beside what's on your screen is a little bit of humor. Hey, Jonah, we made this for you to put on the back of your car, a fish logo with a little man in its belly uh, wanting out. I wonder if Jesus had Jonah as one of his favorite characters as well because he uses it as a powerful pointer to the only sign that a hard-hearted generation would receive that he was the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. You know, we can very quickly research how many of the Old Testament books Jesus quoted from. And he has some of its favorites. Um, He doesn't quote from all of them at all. In fact, he quotes from just a handful if you review it. And so as we zoom out to catch a 10,000 foot view, we see that the Old Testament is first the story of a people. Their unique up and down topsy-turvy relationship with the one God, the maker of all things, who chose to set this people apart to accomplish his will and his purpose for them and ultimately for the world. In you, all nations will be blessed, he said to Abraham. It's a story of promises made and promises kept, of prophecy, of the painful fruit of rebellion and idolatry and the incredible mercy of God as he worked with his wayward children. We read Paul when he writes, all these things happen as examples for us on whom the ends of the earth have come. It helps to keep in mind that the writers of the Old Testament were not seeking to tell the story from a purely factual basis, nor a scientific basis, but from a theological basis. Our Savior tells us how to make sense of the Old Testament. In John 5 and verse 39, he said to his own Jewish audience, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that testify of me or on my behalf. Adam Hamilton writes again, Jesus routinely challenges the prevailing interpretation of scripture and regularly calls his hearers and Pharisees to move beyond the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. Think of his statements, you have heard it said that, but I tell you. So as we look at the scripture, and there are many different views of the authority of Scripture, um, with whether it's uh, plenary verbal inspiration, that every single word is exactly what God wanted us to have. And I believe that he did inspire the Bible. But I also know that with that said, I'm not capable of receiving every word that he has put down. I'm the flaw. And as you and I read the Bible, every one of us interprets it the best that we're able, and as Christians, with the guidance of the Spirit of God. And so the overall purpose of the Old Testament, as we read Jesus' words and also Jesus' statement on the road to Emmaus, that uh, all these, don't you know that this all testifies of me? He is the fulfillment of what the Old Testament points us to. And he reminds us that our relationship with him actually changes the way that we understand and read and apply the Old Testament. You can go home and have a cheeseburger this afternoon and not break 
the spirit and the intent of God's law. Um, on the other hand, Jesus said, you can't go about lusting, killing, hating. So understanding what has come before us, before you and me, gives us a more sure footing in our relationship with our Savior and with our Creator. May we continue to learn of him, follow him, trust him, obey him. May the characters and the events of the Old Testament also speak to us today through the lens of Christ. May they come to life for us in new ways as we see how they point to God's love and his mercy, his justice, that he keeps every promise, that he is continually steadfastly faithful, that we have not had to earn that salvation, but like Abraham, we are called to believe and to trust in his purpose for us that he has made complete in Christ. Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the inspiration of your word, for the people and events and the places that are brought to us over thousands of years from a different cultural perspective. And yet, as the translators have rendered it from the original manuscripts in ways that we can understand and perceive, may we, like Mark Twain, set our hope on the things we can understand continue to learn and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Continue to trust you. Continue to know that your word is sure. We ask these things in his name. Amen.